Good morning, Fredericktown Baptist. How's everyone doing? It's great to be here with you all this morning. <clears throat> this is my first time seeing you guys in 2018, so Happy New Year to all of you. I hope you guys are having a good year so far. I'm blessed here today to talk to you uh, on 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as we continue our series through this wonderful book uh, addressing the church at Corinth. So I'm going to do a two-part series, uh, and I want to share with you what we're talking about. So um, part one of the series is called, uh, it's called Lord of the Rings. So the whole idea is that God is the Lord of our rings. So part one is going to talk about honoring the marriage bed. And this is God's design and purpose for sexual intimacy. If you remember to Church of Corinth, there was a lot of sexual brokenness of these men and women who are part now of the church. So we're going to dig into that. And that actually very much so links right into part two, which is honoring the marriage covenant. God's ideal, but yet the reality of divorce. Now, if you are single and you're sitting here and you're like, oh, we're going to talk about marriage. I beg you, I beg you to pay attention. The Apostle Paul addresses singleness in this chapter in a very significant way. In fact, he calls it a gift. You know, the church historically hasn't done a good job talking about sexual intimacy. And quite frankly, that is a shame. After all, God designed it. He could have made it miserable, but he didn't. So he put pleasure senses into the whole calculus. He could have made it miserable, but God designed it. But he designed it for a reason. And we are in a culture that denies what's called teleology, which is design. Everything is just infantile to reptile to gentile, the theory of evolution. Everything is that. You're just another animal. So before we dive into uh, 1 Corinthians 7, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and get into a little bit of 1 Corinthians 6 because I think it really sets up 7 nicely. So first of all, let me do a little backdrop of the Corinthian people. Remember I said it's a lot like our culture today. As a matter of fact, it's amazing. If you really want to learn about how to uh, uh, be the church today, and maybe even some warnings to take from it, look at the church at Corinth. They're very captivated with athletic events. They're the, the athletic, one of the athletic capitals at the Ithmus. They had a high focus on outward beauty to look like the gods, if you will. And in Corinth, it was the location of the famous temple to Aphrodite, which was the goddess of love. But of course, the Romans minimized love to emotions and sexual pleasure. So she was really the goddess of sexual pleasure. They were so sexually active without any condemnation that literally there was a slang term in the day that was called the Corinthized. And it meant having sex outside of marriage with whomever you like. Today, we call it Californication, which I told you guys before, something out on the left coast. So we see there's a lot of it kind of ties in. So let me drop into 1 Corinthians 6 for you and kind of lay out the sexual brokenness that was early in the church. And I think it's really important because Apostle Paul is saying something here. He's saying that the body is important. Brother, can you do the slides for me? This thing's killing me always. So, <clears throat> I, this thing hates me, and I think I, it's mutual. I hate it too. So, 1 Corinthians 6, let's get into the topic. Yet the body is not for morality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but he also raised us up through his power. Do not take, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of the body of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For he says, goes all the way back to creation, everything is tied into origins, folks. 
that the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one in spirit with him. Flee immorality. He doesn't say hang out. He doesn't say chill and wait to be tempted. And then maybe leave. Flee. It is run immorality. Because every other sin that a man commits is outside of the body. So there's something unique with sexual sin and how it damages the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God and that you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This section lists, it, this comes right after the Apostle Paul lists who was members of the church. So within the church, we had former homosexuals. We had former male prostitutes who sold themselves. We had former adulterers, former players, is what it says in the Living Bible. <clears throat> but what's so cool about that is there's all this sexual brokenness sitting within the congregation. And the Apostle Paul does something interesting. He says, as some of you were, past tense, as some of you were, this was such a part of who you were, it took up your identity. But he says your identity is no longer in your sexual brokenness, but it is in Christ for you are washed. You are sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful promise. And this was so important because in the culture they had a very low view of the body due to their philosophy or their worldview. And this philosophy became the foundation of what was known as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. So the Gnostics had this secret knowledge that they had. And they had the separation between the body as bad and the immaterial souls kind of trapped in this bad body. In the, the New Testament dealt with this in little seedlings in, in Colossians and throughout the book, but Gnosticism really took full root in the second century. In fact, the early church fathers who are the disciples of the apostles were called the, get this, the anti-Gnostic fathers. And as Easter comes around again, the historical revisitism channel, A&E, and all that start having all these little things about the Bible and about these books that lost the battle, as if we determined what the Bible was. The Bible was closed and was discovered in the first century, and it was the second century where all these books were written, and we know that because they're Gnostic books, and Gnosticism wasn't fully developed to them, and the reason why they're pushing this is because we are a new Gnostic culture. I'm a female trapped in a man's body. I'm a, I'm a man trapped in a female's body. There's this view, this dichotomized between the material world and the immaterial substance. It's the new Gnosticism. And the university professors act like the new Gnostics, the elite who know all these things that you don't know yet. But we are absorbing this in our culture in a very significant way. And it has a big impact on us. From a biblical worldview, the body is good. This is why Jesus rose bodily. He didn't rise spiritually. He rose bodily. So we have our own cultural context and this framework that, that this sits in. So let me lay that out a little bit for us. So the two worldviews that are battling us today, we have secular humanism. Now, you never hear this as a religious view that you're getting, but this is the religious view you're getting, especially you millennial and the next generation. You guys are getting this. We used to just get in college. I'm going to show you some college textbooks. It moved to high school, but after 9-11, it moved in all from kindergarten on. You're getting indoctrinated with this worldview, and it's being called science. Science doesn't tell us anything. It just gives us data. The scientist is the one who tells us what it means, and it's always within this naturalistic framework. I was listening to two sexual studies uh, about two weeks ago. They were studies, and there were 78 people. 
78 people with a survey? Oh my gosh, that's a study? That qualifies as science? You've got to be kidding me. But let me lay out and compare and contrast the secular humanistic worldview versus Christianity. From the secular humanistic worldview, there is no God, and your origins are random chance and natural selection. Evil either doesn't exist or is just due to ignorance. Human nature is naturally good, even though the person who believes this proves it to themselves that it's not naturally good, but it's a good gone bad daily. <clears throat> Destiny none. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. And marriage is simply a contract between two people in love, maybe multiple people who share life. It all depends because it changes with culture, and this is called the revisionist view. But then within the court system, there's a view called legal positivism, where they believe that they then create the moral code. And it's now turned into not just a religion, but a new form of fundamentalism. Obey or pay. And you can see it constantly. But within Christianity, it's a totally different framework, a totally different foundation. We believe that God not only exists, but he's a personal creator. In fact, us as the effect can find stuff out about the cause because we have personal properties as well. We are uniquely created in God's image. Evil is natural moral evil is caused by our rebellion. So we're the good gone bad. Every time we hear what we ought to do, we go, I ought to do the opposite. We want to be God of our own lives. It's, it's, it's normal for us, and it wasn't supposed to be that way. Ethics is prescriptive. It's not relative. The person who says all truth is relative, just ask him, is that true? All truth is relative is being offered as the absolute truth, but yet they say it's all relative. Yes, Logic, that's why they don't teach it anymore. <clears throat> Destiny, either heaven or hell, you spend time with God or without him. And marriage is a male-female covenant made before God and consummated in a one-flesh union called the conjugal view of marriage. So I'm going to show you some things to kind of set up our own cultural framework that we're getting. So I'm going to give you some college books, and I want you parents to remember that you're paying for this. <clears throat> what a brilliant plan. So secular humanism is built on a foundation that there is no God. So here's a sociology textbook that begins with the foundation of the fact that, hey, you're just an animal and you just separated. You know, you have the same genes as 92%, 89%. It bounces back and forth between you and a monkey and also a banana. It ought to tell you that we're totally different that there's something else going on because 8% of material is not enough to make up the difference between me and a banana. Bananas don't contemplate their existence. Why am I here and what's my purpose? But we do. But we do. All modern sociology, psychology, all presuppose this view of origins and it is critical. But we get played because in our pride, which is the last thing I talk to you guys about, we hate feeling stupid. We hate feeling that we're anti-science, as someone is giving another religion to you, but they don't even realize it. This is philosophy. This is a view to are simply another animal. And there's a huge impact on this view. It is an undercurrent that if you hold it, it causes trouble. And it determines, it believes that then psychology comes along and says, well then, if you're just another animal, we can look at animals to determine what is normative. So then we go to a psychology textbook. Remember I told you I collected some of these books when I was teaching down at American University. So here you go. Secular humanism says, well, sex is pleasure as an end. Now remember the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill and Acts 17 is a great chapter to read, because in Acts 17, 26, he was debating the, the intellectuals of the day at the Aragopolis on Mars Hill. And there was two philosophies he was battling. It, it was the Epicureans, which believed that you could tell what's true by whatever brings the most pleasure. And you had the Sophists, who believed that all truth was relative. So you see those coming together. So look at what psychology tells us. And I quote, page 21 of the psychology textbook. Bonobo chimpanzees are a fascinating species. 
These small primate, primates live in tropical forests of Zaire and a few other countries, and they have recently been the subject of scientific interest. Why? Primarily because, in contrast to other primate species, including our own, they seem to live together in almost total harmony. Fights and bullying and all other forms of aggression are almost unknown. What accounts for their calm and peaceful existence? One possibility involves their sexual behavior. Bonobos win the prize when they, among primates for their high interest in sex. They often have sexual relations 20 or more times a day. <laughs> and females are just as enthusiastic about these activities as males. Bonobos seem to use sexual relations as a means of reducing tension and anxiety. Whenever they're frightened or upset, they quickly pair up and begin mating. Is there a lesson for our own species? The contemplative question we all must answer. So we have two worldviews that are competing narratives. They want you to put your story in that meta-narrative. And where you see yourself in that story is everything. So either marriage matters and sexual intimacy has a purpose beyond merely pleasure, which is the biblical view, or marriage is just a piece of paper. And sex is merely to serve ourselves with pleasure as an end. And the minute I lose my feelings and sexual interest, I just go find another piece of paper. Now, as this is a backdrop, you can see we're a lot like the Corinthian church. We have our philosophers telling us what worldview to hold. And now starting to make us hold that worldview or pay. Always ask yourself, if you believe something, if I'm talking to you right now and you disagree, where did you get the data that you disagree with me on? And how do you know that it's true? Your books have been updated every two years. Now they're automatic and they get updated every year. The world views have changed constantly. Constantly. Now in this context, right, we come to 1 Corinthians 7. And what I love about this is how the Apostle Paul starts it. He goes, now concerning the things in which he wrote. This is kind of interesting. So here, he spends six chapters writing all this information, telling them about their pride, about them fanboying and fangirling behind their favorite pastor, about um, them being drinking milk and not solid food, and all this spiritual immaturity. Then he talks about them... As an example, they have someone who's sleeping with their stepmother, sitting in a congregation, and they're praising and giving hugs every morning, and they're saying, you accept this. Then he, then he gets into the fact that, hey, as some of you were. And he's telling us that God designed us for a purpose. And sexual intimacy has a purpose for it. God is not a cosmic killjoy. He has commands because he loves us. This is how he designed us to operate. And I love this. So he says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And he means sexually. It's a euphemism. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. Now, at this very beginning, this kind of, of course, begs the question, Marriage. What is marriage? Marriage is what brings us together today. Love. True love. For those of you who like the Princess Bride, that's the best I got. So let's unpack right in the Genesis where every time marriage is discussed in the New Testament, Jesus points there. The Apostle Paul points there three or four times. Peter points there. Everyone points back to the beginning. Because your origins are everything. But before we get into this text in Genesis chapter 2, let me kind of just go with Genesis chapter 1 in case you all are reading through the Bible in a year and you started plowing through the book of Genesis. Now Genesis 1 through 2, 4 gives us this kind of chronological order of creation. See that God's a God of order. So you have water, then you have plants who need water, then you have animals who need plants, and then you have us who love beets, 
who eat the animals, who eat the plants. You see, you kind of see how it goes. There's a God of order there. And then out of nowhere, right in verse 27, he says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male. In female, he created them. We are image bearers. God transferred to us these moral qualities, such as truth and goodness, justice, mercy, and love. This is why we know those properties. There's a moral law written on our heart because this presupposed there's a moral law giver. You can't have a prescription without a prescriber. Then God expands in Genesis 2 and highlights and zooms in on day 6, the crown of his creation, the man and the woman. So Genesis 2, beginning at verse 18. The Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone. This is the first time that God says it is not good. And it's the first time that aloneness was experienced. Because God eternally existed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now man, going organic didn't help. Naming all the animals didn't help. Right? He needed another image bearer to help him out. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed it up the place with the flesh. He didn't go right to the ground again. He created woman from the man's side. There's something very symbolic here. The Lord God made the man from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man so god personally introduces them the man said now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman for she was taken out of the man then for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh the man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame Ladies, Eve had no body issues, body image issues at all. Naked and felt no shame. They were together, and this is the foundation of marriage. And what's so interesting with this is here, the reason why men and women are so different is that we complement one another. So look at God. God takes something from the man and creates a woman. Now, my wife has those things that I no longer have. And God left things in me that she doesn't have. And the only way we get access to those things is through a relationship with one another. That we then begin to see God more clearly, experience God more fully. But then comes the fall in Genesis chapter 3, where sin entered the world of disobedience. Now I want you to get this. The biblical sociology is rooted in what's called natural law. Marriage is for all people. It is not merely a religious institution. There was no religious institution in the garden. It's for all people. Genders are obviously binary, male and female. In the conjugal sexual acts between a husband and wife consummate or seal the marriage between one man and one woman. This is an organic sexual union. These organs cannot function independent to bring something about, which is oneness and new life. Now, believe it or not, the Harvard um, Journal of Law and Public Policy, and I'm going to make this available on our website under the YouTube of this, had given um, Robert P. George and Ryan T. Anderson a place to write about the revisionist view of marriage versus a conjugal view of marriage. And are two strong believers, and I love this quote. Quote, Although the world's major religious traditions have historically understood marriage as a union of a man and a woman, that is because of the, that is by nature apt for procreation and childbearing. This suggests merely that no one religion invented marriage. Instead, the demands of our common human nature have shaped however imperfectly, all of the religious traditions to recognize this natural institution. Our whole country's constitution was founded on natural law theory. 
when Elena Kagan was sworn in to the Supreme Court and she was asked by the panel in Congress about natural law theory, she giggled like a tickle me Elmo. She had no idea what that was. This ought to scare you. As such, marriage is the type of social practice whose basic contours can be discerned, can be discovered by our common human reason, whatever our religious background, whether we have one or not. An amazing thing. So then we have the fall, which of course screws it all up, right? <clears throat> Ladies, you get together and you talk and everything you say makes sense, but you tell your husband, he's like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. All of us guys, we get together, everything we talk about makes sense. Then we tell our wives, of what? Don't make any sense. Because we're totally disordered, so, right? So now, good communication is kind of creating this. Becoming one process has become more difficult because of the fall. Then Genesis 4 begins with the start of the family. Genesis 4.1. Now the man had relations with his wife, Eve. The literal translation of this passage, I love this, in Adam experienced his wife, Eve. The Hebrew word translated as have relations or experience is the Hebrew word yada. So wives, if you want to get through to your husbands, enter at, 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 have every conversation end with yada, yada, yada. Some of you will get that later. <clears throat> if you don't, this next section is for you. <clears throat> First Corinthians 7, now the apostle Paul it's so beautiful because you have so many people just so confused. If we keep heading the way we are, imagine not just our children, but our children's children. In all the confusion, there's so much sexual brokenness. And he brings it into its proper context. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Redeem, say, people who were one way. He's saying, here is your ideal. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5. The husband must fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. You see, this mutual submission is right in the Ephesians 5 that Paul digs into later. Stop depriving one another except by mutual agreement and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together sexually that is again so that satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control one of the things you lose when there's a breakdown in the marital context and there's brokenness everywhere is you lose this protective hedge that society is has around marriage. Because remember, society is made up of one little family. So just look at your neighborhood and you keep expanding out. And there's a protective hedge. That's how it was supposed to be. Now humans, unlike other mammals, are the only mammals that have sexual intimacy eye to eye. It's as if it's into me, see. There's something beautiful about sexual intimacy. And understanding God's design is critical. In singles, you don't own, you rent. And renters never treat property as good as owners. The ladies or the, or the gentlemen that you are dating belong to the Lord, I hope, not to you. Ownership equals privilege and responsibility. John MacArthur, in his commentary on this uh, passage, says this, quote, The present tense Greek for the word have authority over indicates a general statement that is always true for spouses, mutual authority over each other's bodies, and is continuous and meant to last throughout the marriage. So let's talk about three aspects of God's design for sexual intimacy. And I hope you see it in a way you've never seen before. First of all, God designed sex for marriage, and it is a marital duty. The word duty means moral obligation. God holds you accountable for it. In this particular instance, 
Sexual pleasure means God designed it into creation for a sacred end. And a sacred end is oneness and procreation. When sexual pleasure is properly placed as the means with oneness as the end, pleasure is not the end. When pleasure is the end, people become objects and other than. But it is a means to a more sacred end, which is oneness. Everything that God designed, it has sacredness in mind. When sexual pleasure is put in that proper context, your wife, men, is indispensable. Your husband's ladies is indispensable. However, when pleasure becomes both the means and the end, your wife or your husband is easily replaceable by any woman or any man, whether real or virtual. This is the dangerous allure of sexual pleasure for pleasure's sake alone and why marriages today are in crisis. God made sexual pleasure both for our enjoyment and a means of sacred ends. And this is where the church got it wrong. Just because you have two kids, I hope as a married couple you had sexual intimacy more than twice. It is made for pleasure, for the purpose of the oneness of your marriage. Your marriage is sacred. And to feel connected, you have to be connected. Intimacy is God's sacred ends to oneness. Rabbi Zachariah says this, quote, Pleasure unbounded by sacredness will leave you emptier than before. So we have this verse in Hebrews 13, 4. And I want to read it to you, then I want to give you my testimony. that's rooted in this verse. Hebrews 13, 4 says this. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So I'm 25 years old. I grew up in the, I grew up in the city of Pittsburgh, moved down here, and went to church. I was a C&E Christian, which means I wasn't a Christian at all. I grew up Catholic, made my confirmation, graduated from church. Don't get on to Catholics. You go to any church, you can hang out and still not be a Christian. So I moved down here, and I was dating this girl. And my nickname for my roommates was Two Week Pete. They thought I was too picky. So I'm dating this girl, and really getting along with her, fine. So I'm starting to fall in love with her. And now, coming from a broken home, and I'll show you, talk about that next week, I'm feeling insecure about, guys, I fall in love with this girl. I'm scared of me in marriage. Because I'm going to blow. I'm not afraid of marriage itself. I always want to get married. But I'm afraid of me in marriage. Because the gift of self-destruction is contagious. So here a guy at work witnesses to me. Does a terrible job by, any, by his sake, but it was an awesome job because he was honest. I had tons of questions. And he couldn't answer them. He said, but he said, I don't know. Greatest answer in the world because it was honest. Between him, catching a Bible answer man while I was sitting on 66 on the way home, and saying, you know what, I need to read the Bible. I bought the one-year Bible and started reading it. So I'm reading the one-year Bible, and at this moment, I'm living with and sleeping with my girlfriend. And I'm studying for a Novell certification. I'm sitting there reading my Bible. Just bought it. And Cheryl's like, what are you doing? I'm like, "Uh, I'm reading the uh, Bible. She's like, well, well, what did you do that for? So I kind of, in an uncomfortable way, told her about my week and so I, I kept reading it. She saw it was serious. She goes, well, I want one. So cool. So I bought her one. And I'm reading the Bible, reading the Bible, reading the Bible. And then I'm seeing, hmm, Jesus has brothers and sisters. Now, Mary can't be a perpetual virgin, yet Jesus had brothers and sisters at the same time, the same set. So then I'm like, now I'm at this crossroads before what I grew up with and what I'm reading the Bible. So I go, well, how do we get the Bible? Went back to the Christian bookstore felt like this blinking yellow arrow is blinking at me, currently sleeping with girlfriend. <clears throat> so I walk in, <clears throat> and um, thank the Lord, she gave me an NIV, 1984 NIV, that's a good one. <clears throat> got the NIV. <clears throat> so um, an NIV with a ribbon bookmark. So I got the NIV, I brought it back, and I started <clears throat> reading the one-year Bible, and then I had all these dates. Then I bought some books on apologetics, Evidence Demands a Verdict. So I read, I plowed through that. Got the second version of Evidence to Man's Verdict, plowed through that. They just, they just updated it, so I recommend you getting it. Plowed through that about halfway, 
Here, six months into it, I give my life to Christ. No lightning bolt, no theophany, no ah. Just a simple prayer in a condo of asking Christ in my life. Things started changing in my life before I even noticed it. And then now I'm like, I'm going to no church. It's just me and my Bible. Right? Not good. So Cheryl, Cheryl and I are still living together, still sleeping together. <clears throat> and it's like, <clears throat> I got through Corinthians somehow through the flesh, but then I get to the Hebrews 13. Now I want to show you something. When you want to do what God your Father wants to do, you can hear. And you can actually listen. There's a difference between hearing and listening. So I read, this was part of our Bible reading that morning. And Cheryl's reading the Bible, and I'm reading the Bible. And I'm sitting there ironing my shirt, because we're going to go out to the mountains right now. I'm ironing my shirt. And I'm kind of arguing with God. I'm like, well, what's the big deal? And I'm sitting there going, da, da, da. I'm like, but I love her. You know, uh, I, I just got engaged to her. And we had this 18-month engagement, because both our parents were alcoholics, so we had no money. So I'm ironing my shirt. And then all of a sudden, literally this phrase just is impressed upon my heart, obey first and your feelings will follow. Then these other, then the questions changed in my heart. I started going, well, how did it work out for me? I started thinking back to my past. Hmm. So I yell, Cheryl, hey, what you thinking of reading this morning? So she's putting a bow in her hair. It's, it'll come back. They were cool then. It'll come back. <clears throat> so she's putting this bow in her hair, <clears throat> and she stops just like this. She's like, yeah, we got to talk about that. Now, look at all this theology I learned at that moment. I learned, Hebrews 4.12, that God's word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, dividing even soul and spirit. I'm learning that God is everywhere, and he speaks to us through his word. When Christians said that God spoke to me, of course, half of them were nuts, but the other half who weren't, I, I finally knew what they meant, right? <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there going, oh, my gosh. So we go out for the day, have a nice time, and start talking about it. I said, look, I said, I just feel like we need to obey first, and our feelings will follow. I said, I don't understand God's boundaries. But God, my father, loves me. And because I lived in rebellion to my earthly father, no doubt I've been in rebellion to my heavenly father. And it's a hedge of protection for a reason. I don't understand it. But that's what faith really is. So we set up boundaries in a home. <clears throat> now, mind you, we had a, a, a little over a year at this time. Set up boundaries in a home. Then God works in mysterious ways. We start plugging into a church. And I started work with youth, and all of a sudden, God gets me of the, of, the, of the next sin, right? This was the greater one. People drive hundreds of miles for sex, so location isn't, location isn't, isn't the issue. So then Ephesians 4 hits me. It says, among God's people, there must not even be a hint of sexual morality. I'm like, hmm. Darn, Lord. So I said, well, I need to move out. Insecurity, me, and relationships, move out. Move out, bought a townhouse, moved out. Then, had our, had our wedding, kept it clean for a year. And after that, of course, we cut back on things because we bought the house early and all that. And we asked ourselves, what did we learn about it? I tell you right now, I would have never said this, that I thought of her as an object, but it's true. Never would have said that because the heart is deceitful above all things, folks. And what we learned is an amazing thing. Our friendship grew, and God blessed our marriage to this day. It's been almost 21 years, and God has blessed our marriage because of our obedience. And he used us, he has a sense of humor, when I was on staff at McLean Bible Church, I was in charge of preparing for marriage. So Cheryl and I would give our story, and we had people make covenants to move out. I had people in the church offer their houses, offer bedrooms. I always challenge God to move out. We had people make commitments uh, to, to sexual purity. And two to four couples, every class, decided not to get married. That is a victory. And there's a reason for it, because I'm going to get into these design elements that God put into intimacy. It's really cool when you see it. It's really awesome. Now I get to share my story with my kids. And Cheryl shares our story with our kids. Because don't be prideful. Some say, and some of you parents may have this question, well, does that, do you lose your authority then? Well, no. Only sinners can be saved. There's two Greek words for hip, hypocrite in the Bible. It's, it's hypocrisis and hypocrites. The first word is applied to an actor, it's really cool, in Greek drama, who pretends to be someone other than himself. 
So as a metaphor, a hypocrite is a person who plays a part in real life under a false appearance, pretending to be someone he or she is not. The second Greek word is even more accusatory. It's saying the person is doing that with the intent of deceit. So, to determine hypocrite or wise counselor, ask yourself, are you pretending to be someone you are not? Pretending to be someone that you're not. Folks, people need the testimonies of sexual brokenness, but it's better not to have one. So let me get into why this is a big deal. Why this is a big deal. If you're all relativism in, as a parent, you say, oh, I don't believe in relativism. Well, you're like, hey, kids, you keep it clean, and, and you pretend like you, you did and you didn't. Sorry to come clean before the Lord first. Time to come clean before the Lord first. And he will honor it, folks, I promise you. He will honor it. I have three teenagers. I'm telling you he'll honor it. So God's design for intimacy is kind of cool. So here's what he put into it, right? Pleasure's not the end, but it's a means to the end, which is oneness. This is the second element. So there's these three out pieces that God puts. It's not just dopamine. Dopamine is just a reward signal. But there's oxytocin, which is a female bonding chemical, and there's vasopressin, which is the mirror that you find in men. The idea is that you're flooded with this during sexual intimacy to bond with the person you're having relations with. This is why the breakup cycles are so powerful. This is why I have women come into my office for marriage counseling who get reconnected with the old boyfriend they slept with who was their first love in high school, and now they feel connected to. You know why? Because of this. God made it to bond. And if you keep on having intimacy with all these different people and you sell yourself short and treat your body not like the temple of the Holy Spirit, asking, is God having fun? But just being sloppy, folks, it's like this duct tape. You, keep, you stick to someone, you bond, you rip it off. Stick to one. What happens? It loses its stickiness. It's bonding potential. <clears throat> I deep dive into this in Man's Ultimate Challenge. So page 178, I say this. The good news of God's design and the purpose of for pleasure becomes bad news when sex is outside of his intended covenantal marital context. The more sexual per partners a person has, the more breakup cycles experienced due to oxytocin, vasopressin bonding meant for oneness. These breakup cycles sever the bond created during intercourse, leaving it damaged for the next relationship, there's a tear, literally. As an illustration, it is if you place a piece of duct tape on one surface, remove it, stick it to another, remove it, and do it again. What happens to the stickiness on the tape needed for a bond? The more is added and removed, the less effective the bond. This casual approach for sex, for pleasure only, degrades the stickiness or bonding ability that God designed into the sexual process for oneness between a husband and wife. And this explains why the hookup generation is experiencing adultery merely a few years into their marriage. And I have them surprised by the younger couples coming into my office. Isn't that cool? If you think about how God designed this, there's a real purpose for it. God's not a cosmic killjoy. He designed it for purpose. The third aspect is that God designed it for societal and cultural health. Pre-1960s, there was only two sexually transmitted diseases. In 2018, now there's over 40 known sexually transmitted diseases. God is telling us because he's our father, he wants to protect us because he loves us, that we're not designed to be sloppy. That's not what he meant it to be. And there is these consequences baked in to the pie, if you will. C.S. Lewis said a society in which conjugal infidelity is tolerated must always, in the long run, be a society adverse to women. Look at the rise of sex trafficking. Northern Virginia is one of the hottest areas. The rise of string of sexual assaults you just keep hearing about in the news. How is secular humanism's view working out for us brothers and sisters? Should we not give at least God's view a try? It's slavery, friends, and we're the ones willingly putting on the chains. God is a loving father. And when pleasure becomes the ends and not merely the means to the sacred good end, then the object of pleasure becomes a false god and an idol made with our own hands. Remember, God 
made pleasure. It was his idea. God gave us the gift of pleasure while the fall of man gave us a curse of demanding an excess of it. So there are two applications, one for Mary and one for singles, and then one for all of us, and we'll close. Mary, your spouse is a gift. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. In the middle of uh, 1 Corinthians 7, the Bible says, In this life, the married will face many troubles. How many of you guys have that highlighted with a P on it for promise? Anyone claiming that? No? No one's naming and claiming that? But why? Because you get two sinners that are naturally selfish, bent away from God's will to their own will under one roof. If you're leaning into God's will, guess what happens? The closer you move to him, the closer you move to one another. Prudes for Christ married couples is not a marriage ministry. Sexual purity is not the absence of sex, but a sex in its proper context. A married couple with a healthy sex life is sexually pure biblically. A marriage partner who withholds sexual intimacy from the partner outside of medical reasons is in disobedience and is dishonoring his or her spouse. It's not the foundation, friends, but it's certainly the glue. So make time. I have a tape acrostic to help memorize, hopefully. Give your marriage time, attention, patience, and effort. This is how you receive and have the emotional, spiritual, mental oneness that you're looking for in your marriage. And for the singles, there's three groups of singles that are addressed in 1 Corinthians 7. The single who's never married, widows, and the single now divorce. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says this about singleness, who himself was single. Yet I wish that all men were even as I am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain as they were, as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord and how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of this world, how he may please his wife and his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried in the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy in both body and spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Singleness is a gift. And being married doesn't make anyone any more spiritual. John MacArthur says this, and I quote, The attitude among Christians today about singleness, however, is often like that of the Jewish tradition in Paul's day. It is looked on as a second-class condition. Not so, says the apostle. If singleness is a gift to to that person, it is God's will for that person to accept and exercise that gift as belonging to the Lord. If that person is, is submissive to God, he or she can live in singleness all his or her life in perfect contentment and happiness. Men, it is your job to lead single men by honoring and treating women with respect in Christ. It'll be easy to stand out in a culture if you do. Ladies, demand to be treated like a lady, a princess of the king, but act like a lady in Christ. Advertising and marketing is a multi-trillion dollar industry. So when you dress, ask yourself, what is your targeting advertising campaign? Maybe you're drawing who your advertising campaign is leading into. The application for all of us is the church is not a museum for saints, but it is a hospital for sinners. But save sinners who desire to honor God. Friends, how's it been working out for you? Make 2018 a year where you dive into trying God's way. You will not be disappointed, I promise you. There's so much sexual brokenness in a culture. It is destroying people. 
And we need to honor Christ and show how it's done. By being imperfect, but desiring to do it God's way. So I'm going to be up here, and I'm going to be praying for uh, us and our, our, our culture and our brokenness. And friends, don't let someone take that away from you. Claim your victory in Christ, and don't let someone take this away from you if someone broke you. Never again. Reclaim that as a victory in Christ. Let's pray.